Welcome back. Here we are on lecture two for unit four. We're looking at German expressionism. We have two, uh, the De Brücke group and the group known as Der Blau Reiter. De Brücke means the bridge, and they believe that they were the between the viewer and art itself, but more importantly, the bridge between art and nature, between emotion and Understanding. And so their work very much is um, in the expressionist vein. It has intense emotion, intense color, sometimes jarring. Uh, the Der Blau Reiter group, on the other hand, which literally translates as the Blue Rider, takes its name from a painting by Kandinsky, who's a Russian artist living and working in Germany. Kandinsky, in fact, uh, advocated for the idea of increasing the amount of abstraction. So we're going to get to actually pure painting in this section. We also will look at the work of some independent expressionists who were not members of formal groups. Uh, so this is the work of Kirschner, who is the de facto leader of De Brucke. And you can see just by looking at the skin tone, look at this kind of sickly green of this character here in this dark hat, you can tell that the colors are not meant to reflect looking at and imitating we're looking instead at an intense emotional uh, connection between these colors. We also know, of course, that as these paintings are being made early part of the 20th century, while the Nazi party is gaining power and gaining control by the time they have really hit total control of the government of Germany, you're going to find that the artists of the Brücke, der Blau Reiter, and the others are going to be by the Nazis, they're going to be labeled as degenerate artists. This is one really pretty funny painting by Kirshner. It is to represent his group of uh, followers, the artists working around him with the same goals and ideas. And him, this is self-portrait here, and he's got his hand here slapping the back of his hand against this newspaper or publication that is showing an article about how he is the leader of the group. It's kind of a funny painting. We also know that he painted it after the group had disbanded, but he claims that it had been made during that time. We also know that he published um, reviews of his own work under an assumed name, probably a little bit of an ego uh, maniac on this art biography. But the way that the painting is constructed is really kind of interesting angular, almost all the shapes are geometric straight lines. Everything's in these kind of heightened analogous colors, meaning side by side on the color wheel from purples to reds on one end into the blues are all colors side by side, but that black and white of the newspaper kind of pops out at you. Other members of other aspects of this geometric abstraction, Carl schmidt Rotlov is one who very much explored the use the rawness and roughness of woodcut, and you can see that in his woodcut on the left. You can see the geometric style that almost feels like a mask in his painting of his paint. Another artist, Eric Heckel, who used woodcut as his uh, one of his primary forms, but also a painter. You get the feeling that these paintings are not necessarily happy. They're a little exaggerated. The shapes are very angular and lots of geometric uh, work is going on. Emil Nolda is another of the movement. This is Emil Nolda's painting, St. Mary of Egypt Among the Sinners, which we want to know for the test. Mary is kind of an scary character here. This is not Mary, the mother of Jesus. This is Mary of Egypt. She was a prostitute, and this scene here shows her being after by her uh, clients. She seems to be kind of enjoying herself as well. But this painting, most of the textbooks only show this piece. They don't show you the whole thing. It's part of a triptych. Check it out. The image on the left is her as a sinner. In the center, this is the character of Mary and not being allowed in because of her uh, being a prostitute. And you see her having this holy vision of Mary outside of the church, and it changes her life. She becomes a hermit, lives in seclusion, repents for her sins, and then toward the end of her life, there's this kind of miraculous story 
priest wandering kind of lost in the woods uh discovering her she asks him uh to return to her to her holy communion when he does she's literally able to walk on water to cross the water body of water to get the communion he comes back a year later to communion again to find that she had died on that night so she's sort of um someone who's gone from the lowest station and the most um, of life to someone who becomes sainted. We switch our attention now to De Blau Rider. Again, the name literally means the Blue Rider. The group in Berlin, Kandinsky and Jalinsky, both Russians working in Germany, are some of the leaders here. And this is one of their goals, was to give expression your inner impulses. They were no longer interested in painting what the eye could see, but rather what the emotional inner life could produce. Also created, and that's what this piece is here, is the cover. Um, it's a woodcut combined with watercolor, some hand coloring, a little bit of work that was used as the cover of their almanac that they published yearly. So Kandinsky's paintings early on feel like fauve paintings. They are too expressive in emotion to be impressionist, and they're too blocky, and uh, they're from the early 1900s, so they don't really fit the post-impression. They feel almost like they could be fauve paintings, but notice that he returns to this theme of mountains and houses again and again and again. Eventually, those are going to turn into truly abstract forms. If you look for it on the next slide, see if you can see something that looks like a mountain with houses on it. It's that kind of intriguing see in the center a mountainous shape with forms with triangular, arguably, roof lines. Now that painting doesn't look anything like the real world. All small pleasures. And of this style of work, Kandinsky said the following quote that I think is really important for us to think about, especially in a chaotic period such as today. Pure abstraction, he wrote, is the only possible response to the confusion World. So he's painting not what he sees, but what he feels. And he's making marks, probably very intuitively, these spiral type back and forth, zigzags that look like lightning bolts, uh, shapes that repeat side by side, lines that nest one after the other, small dots. These are all symbols that we see in his work over and over again. You can really see it here in this one to know for the test, improvisation number 28, second variation. You can see, especially right here, these things that look a little bit like um, rainbows, these curves, these ladder shapes. Those types of forms we see throughout his abstract paintings, they no longer really reference any specific reality. I guess arguably you could say that sort of feels like a mountain here in the top right with our houses again, but it's a pretty far stretch all this really non-objective abstraction. It's not trying to replicate an object in the real world. That, though, brings up a kind of interesting idea. Now, anthropologists and psychologists will talk about the idea of entoptic images. In theory, entoptic image is one that you see in your brain without there being a stimulus from outside, light being processed by your eyes of generalized shapes that you might see if you close your eyes really tightly and press your fingertips gently against your eyelids, you might start to see marks of different shapes and colors. Uh, these can be achieved in different meditative states. Uh, certainly um, some religious practices involve the use of some hallucinogenic um, drugs that might allow you to see in this kind of way. But what's really fascinating is that the categorize there's that grid we were looking at repeated lines dots the kind of lightning bolts nested curves those forms are all really evident in that painting now I'm not saying that he did research into entoptics I think he made these shapes from his imagination but what I think is fascinating is that those forms that you see here in this list are the types of lines and shapes that make up the most ancient cave paintings we see all throughout the world, all continents, all around the world, all about the same time. This in particular is um, 
spots here is one of the horses from a cave in France that we studied quite frequently in our Art History Survey 1. Kind of fascinating to think that abstract art of the 20th century are tapping into similar design and mark making styles as our cave dwelling ancestors. Other the German writer really leaned on the blue part. That's the work of Franz Marc. He paints lots of blue horses and other blue animals. August Mack leaned more on fracturing reality into very abstract forms that take a moment for you to recognize what they are in the real world. This is his last painting. It's actually titled Farewell. It's the last piece that he made. He was killed in action uh, serving in the First World War. Um, on the front lines in Champagne in France. So this is literally the last thing that he created before that event. Jelinski was one of the other leaders of the movement. You can see him here with the exaggerated colors and uh, very geometric forms. The piece to the left is meant to represent a face, although it's an extraordinarily abstract version of a face. This piece also clearly feels mask-like, but also verging on total objective abstraction. There are many other artists uh, who fall into this German expressionist category. This is Oskar Kokoschka, whose work is uh, emotionalized and has a lot of movement in it. We also see the work here of Egon Schiele. Schiele's work has a lot of exaggeration forms, um, very sexualized forms. Often the figures feel very emaciated and elongated in strange ways. He was definitely not uh, an artist that the Nazis would have been uh, in support of, nor Gustav Klimt. Klimt's work very much plays on archetypal things that we've seen previously. You've got the figure of death on this piece, kind of in opposition to or waiting for the ends of the lives of every masculine, feminine. You've got young, old, darker skinned, lighter skinned. This whole area is all of life, but death waiting there in the wings. The artist that we next turn our attention to is Max Beckman. You want to know this piece for the test. This is Beckman's painting, Night. Beckman's kind of an interesting case for us in that Beckman uh, left Germany to escape the Nazis, came to the US, started teaching art. One of my most influential painting instructors, Wally Barker, studied under Max Beckman. So Beckman taught Barker, taught Billy. So in a weird way, Beckman's kind of your art great-grandfather. Um, this painting clearly is not super quote-unquote realistic. It doesn't show naturalism, but it shows the intensity of man's inhumanity to man. There are subjects here that are very triggering and hard to look at. You see a figure being hung. There's a woman bound with clothing that's been split, so the implication of sexual abuse is there. He is definitely who is not going gently um, with the trends toward totalitarianism. His work is almost always interpretation and for a uh, cry for compassion in the face of evil. Some of his work that is best known in country are these triptychs that feel almost like the work that we saw back in the first unit when we looked at the Renaissance. This piece is called The Departure, and you could arguably say some of the same themes are there. You've got bound figures tortured on the side. You have the figure that seems to represent a king, a queen, a child leaving, and you see life changing in the final image. My personal favorite from this period, though, is this one called The Beginning a king figure again, but now as a child, looking out of his window and seeing soldiers. We see him again over here in the painting of the classroom with kids passing notes instead of doing their work. But in the center, we see Beckman again. There's self-portrait for sure. That's him painting a model. But notice that there he is again as a child, kind of interrupting himself, flying through on a rocking horse, playing being this kind of knight character. Kind of interesting to think the old man and the young boy are the same person. One of my favorites of the German experience is Kathy Kolwitz. She is a remarkable printmaker, best known for her woodcuts and lithographs, but she also was quite successful as a sculptor. 
my story is pretty tragic. She had a son who was killed in the First World War and then a grandson who died in the Second World War. And as many of the other artists that we've just looked at, she was considered degenerate by the Nazis, so they shut her down. She wasn't allowed to teach or exhibit. They allowed her to keep painting as long as she didn't show the work to anyone. Um, unfortunately, she died before the war ended, so she never really got to see the evil of the Nazi regime. But you get a feeling that the artwork that she's making, this is a woodcut, wherever you see white again is she's cut into the plate, the rest of the area has been inked in black and printed to paper. She has this remarkable ability to give you really intense emotions with just black and white, just the way that she's able to create these images without a lot of detail in every part of the body if the figures are very believably well drawn. These are some of the most intense pieces of her career. She did lithographs, again, that's our print process on limestone, so they look like crayon or charcoal drawings. This one is Death Takes a Woman, but you see that the woman is holding a child. I think work can really easily be interpreted as a particularly early 20th century female approach to what it would be like to be a woman um, during a period of war. You might not at this time have been able to be a soldier, but you certainly could feel the losses. It's a different kind of war from the home front, and you see that a lot, I think, in her work. The last things I wanted to show you, though, with this unit, or this section, rather, is some cocking imagery here. The painting that you see right there in black and white is actually a piece by Adolf Hitler. On the basis of whether it's good looking for quote-unquote realism, that piece works pretty well. The light's coming from a logical place, shadow's going to a logical place. He's following the rules. So he definitely was someone who used art as propaganda. And one of the things that his um, Ministry of Culture really did was this. It's a bad scan, but you get an idea. If you look in the background, you can see them crying out against Dada. You can see some of the works that we were just looking at hung on the wall. You can see Hitler grinning and his minister of culture there just eating it up. What we're looking at is an exhibition of artwork that considered to be the art of the degenerates. They were saying that these artists were not just bad or not just ideologically opposed to them. They were These artists were subhuman, that they weren't evolved at all, that they were lunatics, madmen. So really the art of the German is very much one that is in opposition to this totalitarian thought. So you might think it's ugly, you might think it's too abstract, you might think it's not real enough, it's not good, but think about the world if you were in a situation where someone told you that only one kind of art could exist, only one kind of thing is good. You're still, of course, welcome to dislike the work you just saw, but at least you live in a world where you have the freedom to make that yourself.